Here's a quote from Albert Einstein. He said, if the bee disappeared off the surface of the globe, then man would only have four years of life left. No more bees, no more pollination, no more plants, no more animals, no more man. Well, guess what? The bees are disappearing in massive numbers all around the world. And if you think I'm being alarmist and that, oh, they'll figure out some way to pollinate the plants, no, they've tried. For a lot of what we eat, only bees work, and they're not working. They're gone. It's called colony collapse disorder, when the hive's inhabitants suddenly disappear, and all that's left are a few queens and some immature workers. Like when a party winds down at Elton John's house. <laughs> a few queens and some immature <laughs> But I think we are the ones suffering from colony collapse disorder. Because although nobody really knows for sure what's killing the bees, it's not Al-Qaeda, and it's not God doing some of his Old Testament shtick, and it's not Winnie the Pooh. It's us. It could be from pesticides or genetically modified food or global warming or the high fructose corn syrup we started to feed them. Recently, it was discovered that bees won't fly near cell phones. The electromagnetic single, signals they emit might screw up the bees' navigation system, knocking them out of the sky. So thanks, big mouth guy in line at Starbucks. You just killed us. <laughs> it's nature's way of saying, can you hear me now? <laughs> Last week, I asked, if it solved global warming, would you give up the TV remote and go back to carting your fat ass over to the television set every time you wanted to change the channel? If it comes down to the cell phone versus the bee, will we choose to literally blather ourselves to death? Will we continue to tell ourselves that we don't have to solve environmental problems? We can just adapt. Build seawalls instead of stopping the ice caps from melting. Don't save the creatures of the earth and the oceans. Just learn to eat the slime and the jellyfish that nothing can kill, like Chinese restaurants are already doing. <laughs> you know what? Maybe you don't need to talk on your cell phone all the time. Maybe you don't need a bag when you buy a keychain. Americans throw out 100 billion plastic bags a year, and they all take a 1,000 years to decompose. Your children's children's children will never know you but they'll know you once bought batteries at the 99 cent store because the bag will still be caught in a tree. <laughs> Except there won't be any trees. Sunday is Earth Day. Please educate someone about the birds and the bees, because without bees, humans become the canary in the coal mine, and we make bad canaries, because we're already such sheep. Okay, that's our show. Thank you very much. I'll be at the Hard Rock in Las Vegas, May 4th and 5th, and June 15th and 16th.
Hi, my name is Michael Trout. I'm the CEO, founder of FoundUps. I'm a serial innovator. And I want to explain to you what this data means to an innovator. When I look at this, it immediately go, I go, wow, this fits with innovation. And I'll explain it. Now, there's some specific milestones. Let me explain this graph here. This is basically number of producing colonies, right, in the millions, right, in the United States. And understand, you know, the United States has a pretty substantial honey production market. Um, mainly all small. They're not big companies, not like Monsanto's or, or um, you know, or um, um, kind of think of the uh, Bear or these other ones. These are these are kind of family-owned businesses and everything else. They don't have a lot of clout and everything else. Um, but basically in 1940s uh, to 45 after the war, basically the production jumped up. Um, getting into bees is cheap. Bees do all the work. I mean, the industry, the methods hasn't changed in really 100 years. Okay, they still use the same technology and everything else. Um, and bees are, re are representative um, over 150 billion euros of food that equates to about you know 250 uh, uh, billion dollars some say that the pollination market is up to two trillion dollars right so we're talking about a massive market if pollinators die now understand too that this is recording what's known as social bees the honey bees all right so we are replenishing we're actively replenishing these colonies using our technology using you know you have to imagine what's happening to the majority of bees, which are what's known as solitary bees and other bees, which represent, they pollinate 70% um, of the food. One out of three bites is food from these bees, not just honeybees. There's over 20 to 30,000 different species, and honeybees make up a small amount. So you've got to, when you look at this graph, you've got to think of the bigger picture that if these bees are going down like this, right, from and I've added this here because we know we've had a 30% decline starting in 2000 with colony collapse. The EPA didn't put the data, so I did the 30% decline right here. It's crashing, and notice it crashed here too. And I'll explain to you what's going on here. So basically, um, I want to you know this data. Um, it's pretty obvious if you look at history what went on here. Carter passed some very strong, the most stringent pesticide regulation in the history of America happened right here. It's never existed ever since. And look, the bees started to recover. They started to go up a little bit, right? Um, Reagan took office. He pretty much dismantled. There's plenty of evidence. You can actually, you know, read the book on politics and pesticides. And he basically ushered in a whole new era. And as a result of his, you know, policy, and also at this stage, we created the lobbyists became very powerful at this at this point, right? Uh, pesticide companies became free reign, and the whole environmental movement was basically killed, destroyed uh, by the Reagan policy. Um, the other thing that happened here, okay, is that systemic pesticides, which were developed around here, and you notice how it flattened out. It was growing, going. There was a lot of money going in. This is when Japan crashed in the 1990s, right? So. Um, and uh, as a result, it affect our financial markets, and you see it tapered off a little bit here, right? That's because of I would guess because of the global because what Japan hap effect of Japan effect if Japan hadn't collapsed, we would have been here, and it would have been a super crash. But I'm interpreting this. This is actually this is where Japan actually collapsed. So these systemic pesticides, which were developed in the 1990s, late 1990s, I think they hit the market in 1995. Um, and then in 2000, they started selling. Now, these were very expensive. Not a lot of people could afford them. Well, in the course of 10 years, the technology has improved, the cost has gone down, and also the uh, uh, ado uh, ado adoption has gone up. So um, let me show you what this means to me, right? Now, there is... If this will, oh, okay, it's not going to go. All right, so this is something called the end of growth, right? And this has been predicted in 1970. What we're happening now is there's going to be a massive collapse. And I believe that this, the, the, the B is a part of the, what we call canary system warning us. We are right here. Let me show you. And I'm going to continue this talk in the next talk here okay okay this is part two of 
probably a three-part talk, maybe four, um, and about the end of bees. Now, I want to tie this to something that's very important, which is what I'm calling the collapse of growth. A lot of people call it the end of growth. Some people call it the limits to growth. But if you look at this graph here, it's collapse. Collapse of resources, collapse of services per capita, collapse of food per capita, collapse of you know uh, population. It's a collapse. It's not an end. It's a collapse. So notice we are right here. We are basically right at the beginning of the collapse, right? It's right here. We're going to have another five, you know, I'm guessing, you know, I thought this was going to happen a lot later, to be honest with you. Um, I wasn't aware of this data until last month, and it's changed my life completely. It changed my paradigm, and I hope that it will change yours, because understand that this data has been around since 1970, um, and all the modeling, this is all done. And understand that these curves are all exponential. Now, it's very important that you understand the exponential function. And you can. It's simple, simple math. So anytime someone says, oh, I have a 3% growth or a 2% or even a 1.5% growth, right, then ultimately that cannot be maintained scientifically, mathematically, in a finite resource environment. Bees are a finite resource. They're non-renewable, okay? Um, once they're gone, they're gone. Once we kill all the bees, they go extinct. There's no way. The dinosaurs are extinct. There's no way. So it's very important that, you know, and I believe that in many respects, the, 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 the crash of the bees fits right in. It's an alert. It's a canary, right? That's the Japanese actually used it as a canary for our system. Wake up, people. It is here, right? This is part of it. You lose bees, obviously per cap of food production is going to go down, right? Here's the loss of bees right here. Are you going to be able to pollinate $2 trillion worth of food globally by hand? No. People are going to starve. Look at all of a sudden deaths go up, right? This all ties in. So this is very important because this is the big picture and why this the bee situation is so dire because it fits in with this collapse of growth. Now, I want to talk about this chart here, right? So let me um, uh, talk about you know, I just screwed up something because I did something. So what I want to show you here is something what's known as the technology adoption cycle. It, it's based on something called the law of diffusion of innovation. And basically, this is really important because this graph here basically is a representation of this EPA data, right? I'm a serial innovator. The moment I saw it, I go, boom. Here is data that fits right along this graph, and it actually shows you where the different parts come in. So right here would be the innovative stage of pesticides or developing them, right? Um, but basically, they don't exist yet, right? So there's a massive boom because beekeeping is really cheap. Right here is the 1950s. We had the Korean War, the Vietnam War, right? Um, pesticides basically were used in chemical warfare, DDT, remember that stuff? Well, we were using that up till I think the 70s or 60s, right, as a pesticide. And it showed in our bee populations. And right here is what I would say is where the early majority in um, uh, diffusion happened. Because what happened was markets grew up. Uh, pesticide laws were destroyed. Everyone else followed that, um, and ultimately, there you know there was a uh, you know, massive decline in bees and insects. And as I mentioned, this is just you know honeybees that we have data on. We don't have bees on the 20,000 plus solitary bees that don't sting you, that are very important, that are also being devastated. And we already know that certain uh, bumblebees have gone extinct, right? Two bumblebee types in England have gone extinct. God knows how many others. We know folks like Monsanto is, is bribing to get into Indonesia and other places um, in order to, you know, to basically own own crops. And um, if I was to kind of talk about this here, you know, look at this here, I've, re I've reversed it because basically what I wanted to show you is the red is the bee crash that we're going on right now, that you can read this. Here is the innovation, early adapt adoption. Reagan policy helped later on, and I'll continue next. So 
let me just go back and just quickly review. So here is data from the EPA on losses of beet, uh, uh, starting from 1940s. The, actually, the chart had 1945, 1945, so I think that was a typo. So I actually put it to 1940. So I'm not sure when in 1940 their data started. Um, but it didn't seem weird that it grew that much in one year, but maybe it did. Um, that was the only change. I also added this 2012 because it wasn't on their data, and I'm speculating that, that bee populations have crashed by 30% um, during that time, um, and that's the figure that we had. It may be more than that. Um, it, I doubt it's less. So um, what I did was show and explain what's known as the technology Adopt, uh, adoption cycle, which is very important because it's how everything, if you look at Wikipedia, you look at everything, everything grows using this uh, cycle. I also showed basically where each stage, the innovation stage, the early adapter stage, and actually the early majority stage happen. And now we're actually getting into the late majority stage. Okay. Um, and uh, I was basically explaining the different parts. So if you think of innovation of pesticides started in the 40s and 50s, early ad adaptation, we had the agri-boon, you know, the, the, the bread basket, everything in the 50s just, just going crazy with, you know, with growth. Um, we then had, a, you notice there's a gap here because right here in our data, the bees go up, which the EPA doesn't explain. But it's funny, the, the, the bees go up and then they crash, but the, the only the only thing that's that's common here is we had Carter passing the most stringent pesticide restriction laws ever, ever in the history of humanity, right? Ne we've never seen anything like it. And what we need to do is look for countries which have very strong pesticide laws, and I bet we'll find that their bee populations are fine. Um, or what we do is run a trial. If you have a state or something else, just ban pesticides for five years, okay? Just, you know, take make an uh, auditorium on them and see what happens to the beekeepers and everything else. And I guarantee that your bees are going to recover, right? Um, late majority, basically systemic pesticides and laggards. I kind of put it together here. Um, these systemic pesticides are super pesticides. They're like they're super drugs, and they were very expensive. They're developed just in the late 90s. Uh, the C treatment, which Monsanto is the one that basically innovated, that's why they're getting a lot of flack. It's 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 systemic pesticides and in, in seeds. Uh, basically, don't do anything. You just plant the seed. It has the pesticide in it, and anything that eats it or takes pollen or or anything is screwed. They die, um, and their cost obviously in 10 years have gone down. Now they're getting worldwide penetration, and they've had great results. You know, it kills, it's, it exterminates, it destroys anything eating it, including the, the beneficial bees. So the pollinators that we need are being devastated by this, you know, this technology. Um, so um, what's happening now is there's a bee crash. So what I want to show you is I'm going to kind of invert this to kind of show you this that, that is kind of similar. So if you don't see the graph here, I'm going to try to show it to you. So here I have, I flipped the uh, graph upside down, right? And to try to show you, so if I was to show you this here, all right, here is the innovate, you know, innovation stage of pesticides, which correlate here, right? Here is the um, early adapter, which would correlate here, United States mar market, right? Um, and I've actually put it over the hump, which means it the, the speed and there's a lot of other things going on here you got to look at what's going on this is the boom in, in um, Japan and others a lot of money going into pesticides and then this is where we are now with the crash and it correlates here the pesticide market is pretty much you know penetrate the United States when there's a new product and becomes affordable boom it goes everywhere we are in the you know in the the what's known as the late uh, the the late majority the laggards these guys here in the blue, these are, who do you think these are? These are the folks who are the um, anti-pesticide users. These guys will not use the organic food folks right here. So where is the organic food uh, right now? Organic foods right now is at the it's just they just they've crossed the innovation they're in the early adoption stage okay they've probably crossed the chasm right it took a long time for organic foods they're not in the early majority yet they're not late majority but that's where we need to get them and if we can get them we can save the bee so 
I want to conclude here by being proactive. I'm an innovator. Innovators basically bring about solutions to big challenges. And if you know anything about me, you know, I've innovated a solution to change the startup. In 2001, I started trying to innovate a solution to change global education. And now I'm providing you a solution on how to help the bees. The good news is we know that if we can bring about political change, we can do that. Now, recently, there was a group that did just that. Now, I don't believe in everything that they were doing, right? And uh, that group ultimately is Coney 2012. I don't believe doing witch hunts is proactive because ultimately people can abuse witch hunts, which is that what we saw, right? We did a witch hunt for this guy and people took advantage of that witch hunt in order to, you know, potentially take, you know, advantage of oil assets and other things. We're not talking about a witch hunt here, guys. We're talking about using the same framework, which I call going uh, Coney 2012 for something, right? going 2012 for it. That's what a framework that I've developed. And the framework is really simple, right? I, t- I looked at Co- uh, Coney 2012. I said, what are the problems with Co- Coney 2012? Well, number one is an organization. Well, number one, we're headless. There is no entity behind Save Our Bees. There's no one getting the money behind Save Our Bees. It's up to you, small groups, grassroots initiatives, us working together. The thing is, I have a master's in nonprofit administration management. You don't need nonprofits anymore. Ultimately, they're dinosaurs. We can bring about the action we need using this new kind of viral framework, which I do have to give credit to, Coney 2012 proved. So what is this framework? Where the first thing you you do, right, is we've got to set up town halls. How do we set up town halls? Is you launch a group on Facebook. A group, not a like page. A group, a group, because you can actually conscript your best friends to it. Um, you can conscript all your friends to it, but understand 16.5% are going to be annoyed because they're laggards and they'll never see a problem even if you put it in front of them. So they're going to bitch about it. So it depends on you know how you can handle it in different ways. You can just bring your friends. You can bring everyone. I bring everyone, right? My attitude is if you don't see this as a problem, you can always drop me as a friend, right? Um, number two is get a petition going. I've got Japan's going. We need 193 petitions. Every country in the United Nations needs to be petitioned right? UN countries. Um, I don't think there's a pesticide problem in North Korea. I don't think in a lot of these other countries, I don't think they have the money. I don't think they're going to have a bee population. I could be wrong. So if you want to go and don't get offended because I said 193, there's a lot of different numbers. I just picked the UN numbers. Vote with your mouth. Stop buying pesticide pesticide treated food. Okay. Now I don't have much of a choice in Japan because all food here is probably treated with pesticides um but ultimately you have organic um and that is our strongest voice just stop buying monsanto just say is this is this pesticide treated stop buying it i guarantee if we can get the 99 percent the occupied movement folks doing that right stop buying pesticide treated food then we're going to see significant change right number four launch a proactive initiative now Understand, there's 20,000 plus solitary bees, okay? Species, that is, not, you know, kinds of bees. These bees are small. You can grab them. I've got videos I can share. Now, to be honest with you, less than a month ago, I didn't know they existed. I thought there was only honeybees, and I thought they all stung the shit out of you, right? No, they don't, right? Solitary bees are amazing. They're fun. You can set up habitats. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff that you can do. You can watch my videos. Just Google solitary bee habitat. If you can handle a drill and screw some, you know, just screw into wood, you can create a habitat, right? So let's start helping those indigenous bees. Create bee gardens and other things. Launch cheap crowdfunding initiatives. Um, that basically distribute information you know the initiative should not be more than five hundred dollars okay um and what we need to do and i'm working on getting some foundations to support and see these initiatives seed these initiatives with a hundred dollars or 200 to help them going because i've done some talks on that 95 percent over 95 percent crowdfunding fails we need to get at least a base now if we build this we work together we can fix this very quickly as coney 12 showed us thanks my name is michael trout thanks for listening 
Do you have a question for Peter? I, I have many. Um, but let me start with the process of this unfolding. Now, I'm a big believer in technology, great fan of humanity, etc., etc. But do you actually see this unfolding fast enough to prevent the crisis from actually getting out of control? I'm not saying we won't get where you're saying in the end, but what's the path like to get there? So, unfortunately, I have very little confidence in governments and large corporations. I do have extraordinary confidence in, in the innovators that are out there. And literally what we've seen is breakthroughs that are fundamental in nature, that change everything. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where they are, who they are, but I do know that the more empowered individuals that we have on this planet, the better connected they are, like that woman in Manchester, England, that gives me confidence. What's your question for Paul? Every century, people are worried that they've got the biggest problems in the world, mm -hmm. that this is the problem that's going to destroy them. And yet we have consistently overcome those problems. Mm. Why not now? The, the very simple difference is the Earth wasn't full before. There was actually space for us to do it. The difference now is that we actually have to get past this incredible size of the economy. I mean, I mean and we just say, you don't have faith in governments and corporations. Well, guess who's running the world right now? So we have to get them out of the way, and that's not going to happen smoothly. And that's the issue to me: is the the transition. You know, it's like the the billions of poor people in China, India, and Africa don't want an iTunes store, right? They want cars and chickens and milk and houses and TVs. They want stuff. And yes, what you're saying will get us there, I think, by the end of this century. But in the process of them getting that stuff, there's going to be an almighty crash as the physical limits come up against you know, our, our, our desires. Paul, when, um, when, I, when I flew here from New York last week, I flew over mountains and vast open fields. And so, I'm like, it didn't look mm. like the earth was full. What, what <laughs> is, isn't, isn't your statement kind of a, a lack of imagination about what human ingenuity could do with that space. Sure. Look, I, again, it's not, as I said in my talk, it's not that we don't have the capacity to do it. It's not that it's not conceptually possible, right? It's not that there isn't enough resources or space, or whatever, to feed us all and do all that stuff. The question is to go from here to there. If you look at the science, the science says we're depleting resources at a rate 50% faster than they're, being, they're available. Right? And that's just economics, it's physics, it's basic science. So again, not what's possible, but we've got to move the oil industry out of the way in 20 years, and the coal industry. When these guys aren't going to say, oh, sorry, yep, you're right, you had a better idea, bye. They're going to say, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, Peter, you, you expressed your, your concern about the, the ability of governments to do it. Isn't, isn't that the possible stake in the heart of, of your idea, that you've got all, this, all these ideas are there, but the complexity of the world that we're in and the kind of human psychological quirks that we have where people don't always act in their long-term interests, or certainly groups of people don't always seem to, that that could kill us? So, I'm not positing that we're going to have to depend on using some technology that's more expensive. No, I'm positing actually the creation of technologies, you know, let's use Dean Kamen's example of something that produces water at two cents a liter, which is actually cheaper than it costs to move the water in the first place. Mm. So solar, if we're able, actually able to bring it down in price, we're going to hear about battery technology breakthroughs. We have extraordinary technology coming online, and I would posit that the fact that the earth is full and we're, we are going to peak and as we make a healthier and better educated populace that's the one thing we know that drives population rates mm. down so if we want to make the earth less full the best thing we can do is educate and make people the healthiest we possibly can on this planet Which... but their additional minds plugged in is the greatest hope I believe we have mm. for solving these problems but, but your, your hope is undermining his fear which means that nothing's going to get done <laughs> Look, this is, this is a serious question because, you know, denial is very comforting, right? We make us feel much better if we believe it won't be bad. And my point is that I'm completely with you on optimism and technology and our capacity, right? But if we believe that will prevent the crisis, we won't be ready for the crisis. And when the crisis comes, which it will come, we'll panic. 
as opposed to saying, OK, we saw it coming, it's time to sort of go to war with that technology and that, that capacity. Let, let me say one thing. I don't want to be sitting here and denying that we have problems. Mm -hmm. No question at sure. all. In fact, we're in the middle of designing X prizes about CO2 carbon capture. That's not the issue. What I'm saying is that the ability to solve the problems isn't going to sit in the White House and it isn't going to sit in a, in a top CEO. It's going to sit with breakthroughs coming out of the people in this audience that we need to keep an eye out for and then go and yeah, deploy. Sure. But so so I, would, I would like to just get a quick show, show of hands here. This is not about who gave the better talk. This is about... I mean, I'm just really curious where the spectrum of Ted um, uh, opinion is. Are you, in your head, not your heart, in your head, are you more inclined to the Peter view of the world or the Paul view of the world? <laughs> Peter. Yeah. And Paul. Yeah. Holy cow, it's very nearly 50-50. It might be 55-45. This is going to be a big conversation all this week, and frankly, probably for the rest of our lives. It's a very big deal. I really, truly thank both of you, you. hugely for starting it off.